All right, everybody, welcome back to the Heart and Hustle podcast. Today, we are sitting across the table from Aaron, the CEO of Arizona Autism United. Today, we're going to learn all about Aaron's journey, how he's built confidence in himself, trusted his team, the process of taking an organization back when he founded it in 2006 with one employee to today where he has over a thousand employees and is doing tens of millions of revenue per year. Now, it hasn't always been rainbows and sunshine. We're gonna talk about how Aaron overcame challenges, how he overcame some tight financial times, but more than that, how he's trying to impact his community for a sustainable future. Today's episode is jam-packed full of amazing nuggets. So let's tune in and learn all about Aaron's journey. Let's get into the show. Have you always had the ability to kind of position these challenges that you've come across as opportunities for you to kind of dive deeper into? I would like to think that's part of my personality. Uh, you know, I'm probably not perfect in that regard, but uh, I do try to, to look to be optimistic in that sense. And in the, one of my old coworkers used to, to uh, talk about the, the analogy of the kite and the rock. Do you know this one? No. Um, so it's the idea that, uh, you know, let's say you've got two strong leaders on your team. One of them's the rock. They're very grounded. They're very like, we can't screw up. We got to make sure all our bases are covered and can be a little more pessimistic, but you know, there's, there's some value in that. And the other one is the kite. We're, we're reaching for the sky. We're, we're dreaming, we're going big, you know what I mean? And to have both, I think is if they're working well together is a great, um, a great way to, to thrive as an organization because without the rock, the kite just flies off and, you know, ends up in a tree. Right. Um, but without the kite, you know, you're just a rock and you're not really doing much. So very early on, you had mentioned that you did not want to be a part of corporate America. And so you wanted to create your own thing. What was that about, Aaron? Gosh, yeah. You know, so I grew up, uh, I don't know, the 80s, 90s. Um, you know, to me, business just wasn't cool. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't all the, uh, the hype of, you know, entrepreneurial tech that you, you see today. It would just look like, you know, big stuffy corporate buildings and suits and you know, stacks of papers and briefcases. And it, it just didn't appeal to me at all. I, I, I liked doing things with people. Uh, I liked, you know, to me, it, what's most important is feeling like I can be myself. I can be authentic. Um, I can have real conversations with people. I don't have to act a certain way or pretend to be a certain way. Um, I think that, you know, the business world has changed so much. Uh, there's, there's still, you know, pros and cons and so on, but but back then for me, I just, I always saw myself doing something kind of unique, something creative, something that was just, I could feel good about. And I knew I was, I was, I was helping the world, you know, doing something positive, um, not, not ripping people off for money. <laughs> <laughs> not selling stuff on TikTok shop, which is totally understandable. <laughs> you know, Here, here's a question about that. Yeah. So, you know, my question for you is, did you have any role models or examples of entrepreneurship when you were growing up or was this kind of a venture into a dark, scary place for you? None that I can think of. I mean, this was kind of the last thing I thought that I would be doing growing up. Um, you know, I look back and there were, I, I guess, some things that I did that uh, maybe sort of set the stage more than I realized at the time. Um Let's see. I, one of the things that that uh, that I did in college was um, I'm, I'm not a very good musician, but I'm like a, a hobbyist musician, I guess. I had friends who were good musicians, and uh, we organized uh, a, a band to to uh, compete in the uh, the Spring Sing event, which is like this big event they do at UCLA. And um, claim to fame, we ended up beating Maroon Five for the best band award. No way! <laughs> Not that we went on to any fame like they did, but uh, you know, it was pretty exciting at the time. But I think what was cool about it is um, it was you know it was a bunch of people, a bunch of friends, and so on. We put together a big act. It was a combination of like um, theater and and music. We did a rendition of Copacabana, Barry Manilow. It's a different story, but the point is like I I really found quickly that like, while everybody was excited about it, nobody was going to follow through with anything. And suddenly I found myself as I'm the one, like, if, if I ever want to do this, I have to make it happen. And I had to just take on this role of being an organizer. 
Um, and, and, you know, and I think that like, as, as unrelated as it sounds, it ended up being like an experience that taught me that like, I'm capable of doing that, of organizing people, of, you know, just scheduling rehearsals, making plans, getting follow through all the communications. And it's very much like when you're, you're building an organization, it's all about the people and how you get them together and communicating and working together towards a common vision and staying committed and following through and showing up when they need to show up. You know what I mean? Um, and th that experience was something that I think showed me that I'm capable of like organizing people around a common goal, which I think while I didn't have the example of an entrepreneur, um, kind of showed me that, uh, you know, when you're building an organization, there's a, there's a skill there. And for whatever reason that, that one stuck out to me as something that, you know, and I, I look back and I'm like, I, I kind of did have the seeds of the way I operate today. You know what I mean? It's really cool to see how those original stories kind of have a big impact in the vision that we're able to cast and get other people to believe in. You know, when we talk about you don't want to be a part of corporate America and you didn't want to, you know, work for the man, that was a, a vision that you had for yourself at one point in time. But in 2006, you started AZA with one employee. Now today, you guys are doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue. You guys have over a thousand employees, which is absolutely nuts. So how did we decide to put all of our energy and focus into this space specifically? What was kind of the decision process like? Yeah, you know, I, I worked in the field first. Um, my, uh, my youngest brother was diagnosed with, with autism when I was in high school. Um, we were about 16 years apart, so he was just a toddler, uh, and I wanted to learn about it, and I went to college, and there was a program there, and I learned about uh, applied behavior analysis or ABA therapy and so on. So I kind of got into the field that way and, and had a clinical interest. Um, I didn't know anything yet about running an organization, but what happened was uh, I went to college uh, out in, uh, in LA where there was quite a bit of uh, infrastructure for autism services. But then I moved to Phoenix where my family was, um, not where I grew up, they moved here after I went to, to college. And uh, I was new to the area and discovered that at the time there was, there was very, very little available to help um, kids like my brother. And so my family was struggling, other families they knew were struggling. And so I kind of got into it by accident in terms of uh, starting to work with lots of other families and got recruited by a local nonprofit to start a program, a parent training program um, that was basically like, hey, let's take what you learned in college and start teaching parents because they don't have anything here and they, they could benefit from this. Um, and so, you know, doing, I apologize. I, I lost my train of thought. What was the question again? No. So we were saying, why did we choose to invest all of our time into this oh, yeah, space? Yeah, right? Yeah, right. 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 So I began working at this other nonprofit and I had never known what a nonprofit is. I, I knew the term, but I didn't understand it. And so first I was there to help the kids and help the families, but um, I had a close relationship with the executive director. It was a small organization. And I just started asking questions like, how are we doing all of this for free? <laughs> you know? This was a very community oriented. They were great at fundraising and it was all new. And I just, you know, again, my sort of like disdain of, of corporate America, but then suddenly discovering like, wait a minute, there's, I, I really like this like organizational stuff. I like this, this team building and systems creation and, and process and, and measuring impact and, you know, and, and making a budget work and like, how are we doing this? I need to learn more. And so that was really how I got turned on to the world of nonprofits. And once I discovered that, I was like, that's it for me. That's, that makes sense to me. I, I, I find that I really enjoy like the, like you said, the entrepreneurial component of it, but I love doing it in a nonprofit environment where we know, and we feel like everything is, is mission oriented and, um, and, and for, for a cause. And so, um, so that to me was sort of the journey. And uh, I, I worked there for a couple of years and then I, I knew some other families that wanted to start something new that was really more focused on just providing services, just growing the, the pool of services available to the community because there just wasn't a lot available and what was out there wasn't very good. And there were more and more kids being diagnosed and more families moving to Arizona. And it just, uh, it was such a need and I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to be, be at the beginning of something, um, which would allow me to learn as I grow, because I, I was new to it. I'd never started a business before or anything like that. Um, but I, I had, you know, a 
enough of a foundation where I felt like if we started small, we could do it and I could learn along the way. Um, and at the very beginning, it was tough. I mean, we, we didn't have any money. We, nobody knew who we were, you know, didn't have any staff. So it was, it was a grind for sure. Um, and there were, you know, certainly times where, um, you know, I can remember uh, some extended family members saying, you know, well, why don't you do this, do something else part time. So, you know, at least have a little income and that kind of yeah. thing at the very beginning. And I said, you know what, practically that makes sense. But if I don't give this 150 percent, it's never going to happen. Like th there's just not enough momentum if I'm not all the way in. So I'm just I had my wife's support. She was she was totally behind me. And we just said, you know what, if we're going to do it, let's do it. And if it fails, then, you know, then it wasn't meant to be. But but we know if we don't give it everything we have, it's going to fail. So we just went all in and uh, it took a, a couple of years to kind of really feel like, OK, I think this is I think this is going to make it, you know. Um, and then it's just been uh, it's been a journey ever since. If you could go back to that younger version of Aaron, right, and you could sit across the table for him for, let's say, five minutes and he's just embarking on this journey being who you are today with all the experiences and the lessons learned, what would you tell him from an advice perspective to kind of navigate these next challenging years? You know, obviously we, we made many mistakes and had many missed opportunities along the way. I don't know that I would consider those regrets. I think a lot of those end up being really important learning experiences. Um, I think I would obviously encourage myself not, not to give up and not to feel defeated. Um, I think that one of the things I'm proud of that I, I really tried to do and probably could have done better, but I think did enough is just really forming relationships with people um, and and really trying to bring in people that I knew and trusted uh, into the early stages to help build it because I didn't know what I was doing enough to really, you know, just like outsource things. Um, and so really being oriented towards teamwork and being involved in everything. I think there were, if I would give myself advice, it would be you know, be, be willing to let go of some things a little sooner. Um, but, but we got there eventually. Um, but I think what's, what's brought us to the point of success we have today is the relationships that, uh, that I have with the people that I work with and that we have with each other and also that we have externally. Um, I felt very strongly at the time that I, I saw a lot of contentious relationships between, um, providers and funders or health plans or, or state government systems or between families and, you know, uh, uh, those systems that sort of are gateways to their services. And sometimes it was appropriate. The families I know felt like they had to fight for a lot and they did sometimes. Um, but I saw a real um, issue. I felt there was a real issue with providers having a very negative attitude toward those systems that ultimately fund them and make their services possible. Um, and I thought there was a great opportunity there to take a different approach and just be much more collaborative and, and recognize that like these are people on the other side of, of the, uh, the aisle here on the, that, that work for the, the state systems or the health plans. And, you know, they're in their own, they have their own contingencies and pressures and environment and, you know, orders and so on and regulations. But like they're people, they care, they want to do a good job. Um, and if we treat them better and, and, and work together, we could probably accomplish more. And um, I think we've, we've done pretty well with that. And, and I have a lot of relationships and have had over the years um, with some, some leaders uh, or people at all levels um, within those agencies. And I think that's gone a long way towards improving services um, and making you know, things better for families. And man, it's easy to stand on that post, if you will, and say, we're not changing, right? And to have that, I would say, negative relationship or perspective about the entire system. How did some of the best leaders who I've spoken to on this podcast have always said something very succinct, which you just did. When we come across challenges, we can either look at these as obstacles that we're going to have to overcome or opportunities. You said this is an opportunity for us to be more collaborative and to build these relationships. Yeah. Have you always had the ability to kind of position these challenges that you've come across as opportunities for you to kind of dive deeper into? I would like to think that's part of my personality. Uh, you know, I'm probably not perfect in that regard. But uh, I do try to, to look to be optimistic in that sense. And in the, one of my old coworkers used to, to uh, talk about the, the analogy of the kite and the rock. Do you know this one? No. Um, so it's the idea that, uh, you know, let's say you've got two strong leaders on your team. One of them's the rock 
they're very grounded. They're very like, we can't screw up. We got to make sure all our bases are covered and can be a little more pessimistic, but you know, there's, there's some value in that. And the other one is the kite. We're, we're reaching for the sky. We're, we're dreaming, we're going big, you know what I mean? And to have both, I think is, if they're working well together is a great, um, a great way to, to thrive as an organization because without the rock, the kite just flies off and, you know, ends up in a tree. Right. Um, but without the kite, you know, you're just a rock and you're not really doing much. And so, so I think I'm, uh, I try to be a little of both, but I think I'm a little bit more of that kite uh, personality. And that's, that's the optimism uh, that that's the seeking the opportunity It's like, you know, Hey, there, there's always a way to improve this. Um, and, you know, one of the thing, one of the other examples was when I started the, the funding for the services we provided was very low. And then, and as a result, the standard of quality was extremely low. It's one of the reasons we, we founded the organization and I didn't know enough about the system to really understand what the opportunities were, but I looked at it and was like, I think we can do better, like just full stop. You know, th that's, that's enough for me. I'm not going to make any promises of what we can and can't do, but I know we can do better than that. I don't care how bad the funding is. And so that, that was sort of the, uh, yeah, the optimist in me just believing that with the right people, the right attitude, the right mission, we could build something that had the same funding source, but at the end of the day, it gives families a better, a better service experience. And, and that's really what we started from. I love this conversation about optimism. You know, part of my personal brand and what I've tried to build on the world of the internet and the people around me is I've always been incredibly positive. I've been in some dark times and the way for me to control getting out of those times was to be positive and was to be uplifting of others. Now, over the recent years, some people have said, Keenan, you know, I've heard the label, you're toxically positive. And so I've tried to reframe this. Yeah, I've, I've, I've tried to reframe that. this into the, the statement of practical optimism. Yeah. Being practical, being able to look at the situation, but still having the power to choose to go towards the optimistic side. And I feel like that optimism is the foundation of long-term success, but also specifically being an entrepreneur, being a founder, having to navigate unknown lands to be able to get your services and funding and everything else that comes along with that. And I'm guessing that you kind of resonate with that too. Yeah, I, I love what you just said. I, I totally uh, agree with that. Uh, I've, been, I've heard that phrase more and more over the last year or two of toxic positivity, that kind of thing. To me, I think that's that's relevant when people feel pressured to only act. Yay, everything is great when there's all kinds of problems that nobody wants to address head on, mm -hmm. right? And 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 that's like an, an when you're in an environment where you're pressured, you you know if you you say no to things or you you disagree with with the boss or something like that. And that's really looked down upon, you know, that that's toxic, right? You, you want to have open, honest conversations. You want to confront problems head on. Um, that said, when, if you have that, uh, that level of trust within your team and people are comfortable speaking out, there's nothing wrong with being like optimistic. Like, I'm so glad you pointed that out. Let's dig in because I believe we can do better. I believe we can fix that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's what you're saying is like, yeah, you've been to some, some dark places, but you believe that can be turned around. And I mean, look at you, you're doing it. So <laughs> the sun not, will always right? come out tomorrow. You know what I mean? And you just got to <laughs> believe in that sun coming up, you yeah, know, you gotta start you, somewhere. you've been intentional in using the word trust a couple times. And I think this is really important for our younger entrepreneurs, our younger leaders who are tuning into this. You know, there's a saying, you can go fast by yourself, but you can go far together. Ooh, One of the things that I often hear is kind of like the it's my baby fallacy, aka I'm the founder. I believe that I can control everything. But when we start to grow, you don't have the opportunity to do that. So you have to put trust into your team to execute. How are you or how did you as a young leader develop that skill set of trusting others to execute on the vision that you kind of put out there for them? Yeah, so I, I used to say that I'm really glad that I started a nonprofit um, because it's not mine. You know what I mean? Even there though it, for many years, it certainly felt that way. And they felt like, well, if, if I'm not, if I don't keep going, like this thing ends, um, that's not the case anymore. But in the early stages, for sure, you know, you're kind of driving the ship. Um, but I felt a sense of freedom in that, like, it's not my money on the line, first of all. Like, I think for an entrepreneur that has, you know, put in their own investment or whatever, that's a lot of pressure, you know, if it falls apart, you're, you know, I, I can understand that. And there's probably a lot of, 
I know I would have struggled a lot with uh, spending and investment decisions when it's just, you know, it's coming out of my personal bank account. Um, on the flip side, you know, wasn't getting paid very much because it's a startup nonprofit, but, you know, that was part of the deal. Um, so I think that for me, there was always a little bit of um, healthy separation there where um, it, it felt like my baby, but I always, I, I would always remind others that like, hey, it's not my organization. You know, people would say like your company, I'd be like, well, it's not mine, you know, but, but I'm, I'm in the leadership role because um, I felt it was important to um, constantly remind ourselves that like, we're all in this, it's a community organization. You know, the idea is someday I step away and it, it goes on without me, right? Um, and we're doing it for a larger purpose. That said, uh, you know, everything you said is, is still applicable, um, especially in the early stages where, you know, at, at the beginning, like you said, one employee, that was me, got to do everything, got to figure everything out. If there's a system that's needed, got to build it, got to, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then those things are, you know, they're not, you're, they're starting from scratch. So there's not a lot of like monitoring or quality control. It's a lot of basically it's in my head and, and hopefully I didn't forget to do anything. And, you know, and I was disciplined enough to double check everything, et cetera. Um, but that's not very sustainable if you want to grow. Um, and so at a certain point, you have to start uh, handing over first little tasks and then eventually big responsibilities, right? Whether, um, you know, like, like, like billing and, and, and the finance and the um, things that are, you know, compliance or the quality of, of services, um, et, et cetera. And so um, for me, you know, again, being, being young, being inexperienced um, there at, at a time when, you know, Arizona was still uh, not as, as uh, large as it is now in terms of the population and the business infrastructure and the nonprofit infrastructure and our services. So, it was a lot of uh, pioneering in a sense, uh, certainly in our field and kind of making it up as we went along. And I started, uh, I remember the very first, I remember really my, my very first hire, uh, other than like, you know, providers to work with families, but to help with managing the organization. Um, I really struggled with that. I was like, well, I, I can't just hire a stranger. Like I, I would have no idea if they were you know, I can't, I, I wouldn't know how to watch what they're doing. And you know what I mean? Like I was so new to it. So I just had to think through who do I know, you know, who do I know that um, would be a good fit for this and would be interested. And so the first few people that we hired um, were people that I either knew personally or sort of like there was, you know, friend of a friend kind of thing, whatever. There, there was enough there that I felt like there, I could, we, I could place some trust in them um, and there was an enthusiasm to kind of like, let's build this together. And, and I think that was really it, you know, just once there was a little bit of momentum and it was like, okay, now I'm starting to get a feel for what it's like to work as a team, to have, you know, some delegated responsibilities to have, you know, uh, meetings where we, we share what we're doing and we set priorities and, you know, delegate tasks and things like that. And, and then eventually you start to, uh, you know, emerge like what it, what the next role could look like and what it would be like to hire someone new and train them. And I mean, it's, you know, now we do it all the time, but it, it was pretty foreign at the beginning. Um, and again, some mistakes were made and, and some, some hires that didn't work out, but also some amazing people that we, we hired uh, in the early stages that we didn't know, but uh, just made a great connection with and were with us for years. And so that, those are very powerful experiences too, when it does work and you see, okay, this is, this is what it looks like when it works. You know, this is how we can begin to build the team. I had another um, amazing CEO on the show previously. His name was Gino, and he talked about having compassion as a leader. He said, Keenan, you know, two of the most compassionate people in your life were your parents because when you were younger, they trusted in you to go through an experience, sometimes fail, sometimes get back up and get an understanding of why you failed. Now, they could have easily taken you out of that situation and had you avoid that all completely, but they allowed for you to have the space so you could fail, and that was compassion. And I feel like we need to be more compassionate as leaders to allow for our team members to have the space so sometimes they need to fall down so they can get back up and have a true understanding of why they failed, which is really important as we kind of grow in an organization as well. Absolutely, yeah, and I think that, uh... Again, for me at that time, not really having that strong uh, business background, um, I didn't really 
know how to lead with, you know, metrics or, um, you know, scoring people's performance or, you know, uh, hard deadlines, that kind of thing. For me, it was much more about, um, you know, values and, and purpose and uh, yeah, absolutely compassion. Um, you know, making mistakes, totally fine. I'm making mistakes all the time. Um, it's all, it's much more about, are we doing it together? Are we open? Like you said, the trust, we're talking about what we're doing. We're, we're all invested in improving and, um, and we're having a good time too. That was really important as well. I mean, you know, to do work like that, especially in the early stages, um, there's not a lot of reward there yet, unless you're really enjoying it and, and enjoying the challenge and enjoying each other. Um, so the dynamics of, of the team to me is, is everything in today as well. Um, we have an unbelievable senior management team. We've grown a really, really strong team of, of program leaders and supervisors. Um, and then each of them have, have their own teams for different departments and programs. Um, and, you know, we're in what they call a people business. So we've, we've got to have um, a culture that is, is all about people enjoying working together and collaborating, having fun, but working hard, um, being committed, uh, being accountable to each other. And I think all of that was, is exactly the same as what I was looking for in the very beginning. You know, one of the things that I often think about as I get a little bit older is the perspective of the journey is so important. You know, often when people reach these huge milestones, like a thousand employees and tens of millions in revenue, often when we reflect, we go back to the times when things were uncertain and we are working as a tight knit team. Have you always had that sense of perspective to kind of think about where you came from and where you're kind of going? I, I, you're right. You do think a lot about the, the struggles when, when through the perspective. And I remember, you know, uh, our first office, every time it rained, the floor would get wet and I'd be <laughs> running across this giant courtyard to the town hall to borrow their mop because I was the only one that worked in this office. I mean, it was just like, wow. Um, I remember, you know, going through some real financial struggles as an organization where, it got real scary and it was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, there were some major changes in our funding sources and we just weren't prepared. Um, and I really, we, you know, I got real vulnerable with our team and it was just like, I, I can't believe this is happening. I'm so sorry. I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but this team was so incredible. Everybody just rallied and um, we, we just got better. I mean, we, we completely turned it around and, and now are doing great. Um, but I think one of the reasons is, you know, at our lowest moment, everybody could have walked away and found another job and they didn't, they cared enough about the team to say, we're just going to work harder. We're going to talk every day. We're going to prioritize. We're, we're going to just, you know, get really geared up to do what we have to do. And, um, and we pulled it off and we got through it. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, when you're building something like that, um, I agree. The reflecting is important. Somebody asked me the other day, we were, we were having a conversation about, we, we've had a lot of growth in the last three, three plus years, like a lot more than, than we've had in previous years. Um, and so we were, we were talking about it and reflecting and, and someone said, you know, when you think back to, you know, how far this has come, are you just like, you know, in awe of, of the uh, milestones? And I said, you know what, I, I'm not at, what, what, what makes me the most like grateful and, and in awe is not the, the numbers, you know, of, of dollars or, or clients or services. It's the fact that there are this many people that choose to dedicate their career to this organization. Like that is so meaningful to me because I think, you know, where you work and what you do with your adult life is one of the biggest decisions of your life. You know, if, if you have the opportunity to make those choices. And the fact that people um, choose to work here and choose to commit and choose to continue when it when it's hard and 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 really pour their energy and their passion and and share it with their family and friends like that is so meaningful to me and that that you know I don't take credit for that personally but that makes me so proud that like we've built something that people love this much you know and it's and when you talked about you know my baby that's where it's like it's not my baby you know it this is our thing we've done it together and. 
and we want to share it with the world and invite others to join. And like, that's the attitude that I love the most. And this is a form of great leadership as well, right? It's not me, but it's all of us. We even had a little moment where you were talking about before we hopped on the podcast where I was like, this isn't me, but this is the team. And it feels so good to be able to kind of push the glory and the recognition to the people around you, because this isn't just us. Like we're not the genius with a million hands, right? We've got lives who are showing up every day, giving their most valuable reset or asset their time to be able to impact other people, which is so powerful, man. Um, so huge congratulations. It's cool to be kind of reflective on the podcast because often I feel like we all don't get enough time to be able to kind of look back and be appreciative of those early days. So that's really cool. Yeah. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because it's, it is. It, it, it's cool for sure. You know, there was something we talked about in our previous conversation, which was innovation. Right. And what I came across since we talked last time was a keynote speech um, by Jeff Bezos. And he was talking about the culture of innovation, but also the culture of open failure inside of Amazon. And he said, guys, I want to tell you about a six hundred and ninety million dollar mistake called the uh, the Fire Phone, the competitor to the iPhone and to the Google Pixel. Now, we spent six hundred and ninety million bucks and it was a big failure, but we did get Alexa and we also got the Kindle out of that. Now, many people would look at that as a huge failure as an organization, but we've built the safe space for people to be able to experiment and continue to push us forward. What do you kind of think about that modality of experimentation and failing forward in the culture? Yeah, ironically, I'm actually reading a book right now called The Everything Store, the biography of Jeff Bezos. It's a great read for uh, if you enjoy business books. Um, it's very well written. And uh, yeah, they had a lot of uh, experimental failures. And, and Jeff Bezos absolutely drove that culture, uh, drove people crazy, according to the book. But, um, you know, it was just always pushing like there, there are absolutely no limits that we're going to not explore an idea that we have. So kind of the extreme um, innovative attitude there. I think, um, I think uh, you know, innovation is, is sort of an overused buzzword, but uh, I do think that absolutely it applies to the way we approach um, our programs and services. Um, we are innovative in the sense that we try to come up with ways to make services uh, accessible to people who typically don't have access to them, um, to make them effective for populations that they're typically not effective for, uh, to, you know, make them to, to fill gaps in needs for ages or um, minorities or uh, socioeconomic groups or just individuals with really difficult behaviors, that kind of thing. Um, we look at that as, again, that optimistic attitude of like, okay, nobody's doing that because it's hard, it's expensive, um, it's, you know, you know what I mean? Like all kinds of reasons, or we don't have the expertise, we don't have the experience, but you know what? Like people need it. People are asking for us and if we can help. And if we have an idea that we think is worth exploring, like let's do that. And, and a lot of our programs have kind of gotten off the ground um, with that attitude. Uh, we have one program in particular called Clinical Family Coaching that our, um, one of our clinical VPs Dr. Aaron Wernz developed. And it was extremely innovative because, you know, he had a background in behavior analysis and so do I, and so do many others. Um, but what we were taught with ABA was that there's a pretty straightforward model where you've got the behavior analyst and then you've got some technicians that are, um, you know, in, they're, they're not um, master's level licensed, but they're, um, you, you supervise them and they do day-to-day -day direct therapy. And then the behavior analyst has a treatment plan and does assessments and guides them, uh, does some training with the parents, et cetera. And that's very effective um, for certain populations, usually uh, younger children. Um, it's in sometimes older as well. But it, that model doesn't work really well when you've got older children, really, really difficult behavior challenges, and families that are really struggling with all kinds of other things, you know, yeah. in the, 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 the realm of life, whether it's, you know, they're, they're in poverty or they, um, they have, you know, all kinds of difficult um, family dynamics or, um, you know, there's just other factors that are making it really difficult to just participate in a straightforward therapy program. 
And these are often families that have bounced around for years to, through different programs. And it's like, they're at this point because either none of that worked or it's just not working anymore. And so we developed uh, a program that is, I, I've just, I just never seen anything like it. Um, it's so intensely focused on parent and caregiver coaching that it's not like, you know, you do the therapy and you throw in a couple hours of, of parent training to keep it consistent. But like the program is parent coaching. Like there's no session in which the parents and caregivers are not participating and are not being taught how to take the lead because the whole concept was there's so many services where, and this is true in, in you know, much of behavioral health, where the model is like, come in, change, and then leave. Yeah. But in many cases, the environment where the problems are happening hasn't changed. And so it's, sometimes it's only a matter of time before you're back at, in the same boat. Mm. And so the model here was, how do we do this whole thing differently so that by the time we leave, we're not actually doing anything really anymore. We're just sort of watching from a distance to make sure the people who are permanent in the child's life are are confident and um and are using effective strategies and, and people are happier and they have better routines um and so that's one program that we're super proud of because it's it's worked with you know some of the hardest cases we get um where others have just not really had answers for and has had some pretty incredible outcomes that are are, are lasting um so we've got a number of programs like that but but you know the innovation part again is sort of like let's just not be feel boxed in by sort of standard approaches um if we you know understand our, our science and our, our treatment models and we're willing to be creative you know and, and work with our funding sources to say hey what if we tried something like this then you know that's how things get better we do the same things time and time again expecting a different result right that is literally einstein's definition of insanity and so thinking about it with a different perspective is super healthy because what got us here is not going to get us there. And, you know, it's just so cool to hear how many lives you guys have been able to impact, Aaron, the people who you've embraced, the culture that you've built, the leaders that you've cultivated. You know, it's a huge accomplishment, man. From 2006 to where we're at here today, you really should be proud of yourself. And I'm going to give you an opportunity again to kind of reflect on all these things that you've accomplished, man. You know, uh, one of the traditions we have here on the podcast is our previous guest, ask you a question. Now, this is an individual CEO from an amazing organization. He wants to know what is the one thing that you know you should be doing to make yourself better, but maybe you're not. Ah, oh, yes. So, <laughs> um, hmm, let me think about that for a second. I, I do think that uh, keeping up with the the growth of the organization is a is a theme that uh, that we're all talking about a lot right now. And I'll give you an example. We just did this project um, through a foundation where we worked with a consultant and did sort of like an, an overall deep dive assessment of the entire organization and looked at programs and systems and et cetera, and sort of scored ourselves like, how are we doing? Are, uh, are, we, are, we, are we in growth? Are we mature? Are we in decline? And one of the uh, surprises was that um, the category of administrative systems, um, we ultimately agreed that we're in decline. And I struggled with this at first because I'm like, we're constantly making our systems better. How can they be in decline? Like we're always like trying to improve. But the aha moment was that it's not that the systems themselves are in decline. It's that the gap between where our systems need to be and where they are is getting bigger because we were growing faster than we were improving. And so I think that um, my challenge is now to really understand, you know, not what did I need to do for the organization a year ago, but what do I need to be doing for it by next year? Um, and I think that one of the things I want to really push myself to do more of is um, building new relationships uh, within the community um, with influential people who can really uh, help the organization grow. Um, and again, you know, I've done that in the past, but that was based on where the organization was then. There's really, a, 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 there's so many things that we do now we, with our, you know, sophisticated management team and, and all of our specialized roles that we don't have to rely on um, outside people to help us with anymore. So now it's much more strategic focused 
Um, and, and that's an area where I do, I do struggle in terms of, um, you know, uh, long-term goal setting and, um, and, and really following through on, you know, we do accomplish a lot, but, um, but it, it, but it is a little bit sort of, uh, we have a general sense of where we're going for things, but it's not as structured as I think it needs to be, um, because we're just bigger now and there's just more to keep track of. And so really having good systems to, um, to manage that and to, um, give people very clear direction, you know, people enjoy knowing exactly what they need to do to contribute. Um, and I think we do, a, we've improved in that area, but, but the bigger you get the, you know, the harder that can be too. Um, so those are, the, I think that's the one area I would like to, uh, improve more on. And that is part of being that visionary leader. You know, I think, uh, you've already done an amazing job of getting you to where you are here today with the team that you've built. And I can't wait to see what the future looks like, Aaron. It's going to be Thank an amazing so ride. Yeah, Absolutely, I man. Well, once again, everybody who's been tuning in, watching and listening today. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you for blessing the show, man. Very much appreciate it. Ah, right back at you. <laughs>